Yeah, I mean, this. I mean, I'm busy all the time now. I mean, it's and I love going to work. I wake up in the morning. I don't have an alarm. I wake up naturally around six forty-five or seven, and I do my thing. And I, I I go to the office, and I can't wait. I mean, office slash studio. It's kind of our flood tide office that has my studio in it. And yeah, I mean, next thing you know, it's five thirty, and it's just that you know, it's just crazy. That was Paul Puckett from the Barely Live podcast talking about a typical morning as an artist and podcaster in the fly fishing space. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you are new to the podcast, firstly, welcome. The first 32 episodes are focused on steelhead, and we are early on right now with Season 2 with a focus of trout fishing. Please subscribe and leave a comment if you have an idea for a Season 3. Just go to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe. In today's episode, I interview Paul Puckett, the artist behind Flood Tide Company, the Barely Live podcast, and numerous pieces of art, and some of the biggest fly fishing magazines. We talk about how Paul put together some of the really great fly fishing art over the years, and how he went from living with his parents to running two uh, fly fishing businesses and two podcasts, all while drinking plenty of beer. Paul talks about the journey he is on and how redfish fits into it in his passion, especially during flood tides. Don't miss this as uh, Paul talks about how he put together some of the first art pieces of his that included Johnny Cash and John Goodman both holding fish. Not entirely legal at the time. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to quickly thank our sponsors. Ascent Fly Fishing has customized fly boxes that they put together for your unique stream. These aren't just flies in a box, but they analyze the bug community in your stream do a summary and provide you with the exact patterns that are in the stream when you want to fish it. These guys are biologists who know their bugs and fish. They have boxes for all different levels, so go to ascentflyfishing.com and grab your custom fly selection today. That's A-S-C-E-N-T flyfishing.com. The original tie right holds flies and hooks securely so you can tie your tippet on with little effort, no matter what the size of the fly. The original Tie Right Senior holds hook sizes 2 up to 14, and the Tie Right Junior holds hook sizes 14 through 24. The Tie Right can help you tie clinch knots, modify, uh, modify clinch knots, and many other knots. So head over to tyright.com and grab your original Tie Right today. That's T Y R I T E.com. So, without further ado, here's Paul Puckett from paulpucketart.com. How's it going, Paul? Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I wanted to, you know, you just, uh, we were just chatting there just briefly and you mentioned, uh, and we talked about the uh, Paul Puckett art there. Um, I was going to talk a lot about uh, the, the podcast you do and some of the other, I guess you have uh, a business going on in the fly fishing space. Um, but, uh, may, yeah, maybe before we dig into all that, maybe we can just talk about a little bit, you know, bring us back to how you got into fly fishing and how, you know, you guys started with the podcast, the barely, uh, barely live sessions, right? Yeah. Barely live. Uh, you know, I got into fly fishing like a lot of people, uh, it's, it's almost cliche, but, you know, I got into fishing with my granddad and then oh, cool. in Texas In Texas, he would kind of put the the bait cast rod and reel down and for some reason at the end of the day he would always break out his his fly rod with bass poppers and i never really understood like what the difference was you know as a kid a 10 year old kid like sitting there looking at your granddad throwing swinging this thing around i'm like man that just looks like too much effort you know like what are you doing <laughs> and uh you know he told me one day he'd teach me but he never got the chance to and then so i took his rods and in high school, basically, I think I was about 15, just started using his fly rod and started getting into tying flies and just was totally consumed at it, you know, um, between baseball and fishing growing up, that's pretty much, and art, that's pretty much what's consumed my life since then and still does. Mm-hmm. Nice. So, and where did the, yeah. and so how did the whole, all of the, uh, barely live, I, I've listened to a few of those episodes now and it's, uh, basically, kind of you and a couple of buddies chatting there. Maybe you can explain to, for those who haven't listened to what, what, uh, yeah. what it's all about. 
I mean, it, I mean, I can't give it any, uh, I can't say anything about it unless I say where I'm from, which is Dallas, Texas. And we at the office, the flood tide office daily listen to this radio show out of Dallas, Texas called the ticket 1310, the ticket. And it's basically a sports sports show. And, uh, Will Abbott, who's one of our partners in flood tide. And we just sit there and listen to it all day. And it's, it's a combination of sports talk, but it's also comedy. It's also all these different sports characters, fake characters. And then when you combine that with when you go fishing, anyone goes fishing and they're hanging out with three or four friends and you walk back to the truck and everyone's hanging out the truck, drinking a beer, you know, whether it's five o'clock in the afternoon, nine o'clock at night, you just find yourself sharing stories and talking and, and BS. And then next thing you know, two hours later, you're like, man, where did that time go? I mean, that's basically where you're like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if you could record, could have recorded the last two hours? I mean, the crazy stories, the ridiculous stuff. And that's basically, that's honestly, we were like, dude, let's start recording a podcast that is literally unedited. Let's not mm-hmm. even, we, we, we kind of plan it. We kind of plan a few things, but the whole idea is get on a tangent, you know, and just go at it, record it. And next yep. thing you know, that's what barely live is. Huh. And, you know, we have a few, ideas of things we want to do and in the fly fishing world i've been in it since i was 18 working in a fly shop and all these different cast of characters that come in the store that you meet at shows or there's always this guy or that guy and the whole idea was to kind of come up and make different characters fake people basically for the Mm -hmm. show that's kind of that's kind of what we do we basically entertain ourselves exactly i mean that's honestly yeah (laughs) so the show is basically for you guys you guys are just buddies out there having fun and recording it what have you seen i mean do you guys look at who's watching it do you do you know like who's out there and do you get feedback from people that are i mean there must be people listening to it right yeah and we you know on soundcloud you can kind of get an idea uh and there probably is a better way to do it i just don't know honestly but I think we average 1,800 to 2,000 listens per show. Mm-hmm. And the frustrating thing about it is since we started it two and a half years ago in the last six months, we just haven't been able to record as many. Um, so we're kind of in a downswing right now, and there's no talk of like quitting. It's just more about getting the band back together and being able to do it more often. Sure. Gotcha. gotcha. But, but yeah, I mean, I, in the Southeast, it's definitely more listens than, than the Northwest. Yeah. But, uh, it's definitely, you know, spanned out there pretty well. It's fun to see that. Mm-hmm. No, that's cool. And uh, and you mentioned Flood Tide. What what um, what is that business all about? And maybe you can talk a little bit about the people that are involved in, in that with you. Yeah. So, like I said, my buddy Will Abbott. I was living in Atlanta, and I did a lot of art shows in Charleston. And I was always coming to Charleston, and I was working at the Fish Hawk in Atlanta, and I was starting to really get into saltwater fishing, uh, red fishing in general. And, um, it was starting to consume my, every thought of my life, those red fish tails, just, I couldn't stop thinking about them. <laughs> and I was doing some art for true flies at the time and did some stuff for Patagonia and, uh, and Yeti and a couple of other things. And I was like, man, I'm doing this art for all these other companies. I should just come up with a logo <laughs> and do my own thing and just see what happens. And, uh, and of course, since I was constantly obsessed with redfish, the logo ended up being a, a redfish tail. And the reason I was going to Charleston, I would always go down there for the flood tides. And so I called it Flood Tide Company. Yeah. I mean, it was just kind of something, nothing too serious. And, yep. you know, the, so it, we kind of started off with the shirt of Walter from Big Lebowski holding, oh, yeah. A, yeah, <laughs> holding a trout. And then I did someone, Johnny Cash, holding a redfish and those kind of, or what started the whole brand basically. Oh, cool. How do you, yeah. when you throw Johnny Cash and stuff up there, how do you get the, do you have to get the rights and all that stuff? Well, you know, at first it was just kind of goofing around with it. I didn't have any intention of doing a whole lot with it, honestly. And then, um, there was a company that bought that art and there was obvious talk that I didn't have the rights for it. And, and they, they knew that and it kind of went downhill from there as yeah. far as John, Johnny Cash, uh, foundation or i guess a state finding out and sure. uh, yeah and as flood tide that kind of stuff we do we've we've kind of 
run the gamut a little bit with those few things and have gotten some some letters from some certain companies to stop so oh yeah <laughs> we, we've run the risk a few times sure but we, yeah what about what about uh you got uh, is john goodman right up on your your barely live logo yeah that's, yeah that's I mean, awesome yeah so that's kind of been the foundation of you know barely live and flood tide but it's it's stretched out a lot from there yeah oh cool yeah you guys always have in your at least a couple of here in some of the uh, the intros, you've got like some movies playing. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, yeah. is it Zoolander? What, what, what's your favorite? What's your favorite movie? <laughs> um, man, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, it's probably in the ballpark of Big Lebowski, Raising Arizona, just yeah. all those ridiculous, silly movies. And you know, everyone everyone has those favorite kind of movies, and there's always those one liners yeah. from those movies, and it's just funny to kind of start each show with those with those in mind yeah. just to kind of basically get the mood going okay like that's what these guys are all about you know kind of set the tone exactly that in uh in a couple of beers you guys what, what is what's your beverage of choice out there um definitely usually beer and honestly it ends up being just cheap beer like bud light and coors light nothing fancy yeah we're uh we're pretty simple dudes yeah i'm not saying that we don't enjoy a, a tasty more tasty beer every now and then but you know, a good Bud Light or Coors Light just gets the job done for yeah. three hours of recording. Exactly. Yeah, no, we, uh, I definitely enjoy a nice IPA, but the problem with that is you can't drink too many of those. Otherwise, you're going to feel a little sick. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we usually start recording at like three in the afternoon, come home at seven o'clock, hammering on IPAs. Would nice. really no. be great for the yeah. wife, usually. It would be <laughs> right. What, what's the, uh, so, so you mentioned Redfish, but what's your, um, I mean, if you had to say kind of your home, uh, waters and kind of the species you, you fish for most. Yeah, definitely redfish. Um, there's a chance here in Charleston, there's seasonal opportunities for like jacks, which is usually June and part of July. Um, you can get lucky and find some sheep's head every now and then. Now, whether they'll eat is a whole other story. Um, and then like in April, May, you're going to get uh, you're going to get amber jacks. You're going to get some cobia out in the deeper water. And then the cobia start coming in more shallow, you know, May and June, especially down in places south of Charleston. So you get some seasonal stuff, but 80% of it's going to be redfish and sheep's head and those types of things. Mm-hmm. And right, which and right, is great. Yeah. So right now, or what, if you had to go tomorrow, what would be, what would you be heading for? Redfish. Um, the only thing is though, here we get a real small window of opportunity because the tides are so huge. Mm. We get, you know, average of five to six foot tides. So you're either wanting the low tide, but when you get those big flood tides, which are around the new moon and the full moon, you're going to look for the high tide. And that happens, you know, five to six days every couple weeks. So mm. I usually, it's kind of like when you live out West and you're looking for a powder day, Yeah, you know, I usually kind of look forward to those flood tides and kind of, pinpoint my days of fishing around those gotcha cool yeah. and what what do you think is as far as getting into fish do you have any um you know any uh secrets or tips or i mean I, i've never fished for them but is it uh i've heard i mean it's pretty much i mean it's they're pretty amazing species right to be yeah going for what, what what do you what do you get out of them what's the most they're they're kind of they're awesome fish i mean they're they're kind of they're kind of bull bulldog type fish i mean they they don't really expect a whole lot out of you they're usually pretty forgiving but on that one day they can just be totally stubborn i mean just it just mm-hmm. depends like you can throw it on their tail one day and they're going to turn around and eat it and then the next day they, they spook when the flies in the air oh, wow. but at the end of, and they're really cool in the way they're so habitual i mean they usually unless they get a lot of pressure you're going to find that school of fish pretty much every day on the same spot uh, they don't move a whole lot. They uh, tend to like their spots. Now, after a season, like after a winter, they might not be there anymore. But yeah, typically they're going to be where you're expecting to see them. Mm-hmm. That's what's really cool about them. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're just a great fish, man. They can be very hard. They can be like Charleston with as much pressure as it's gotten in the last few years. Can be like the Henry's Fork. Like it can be right. the Henry's Fork Assault. But you know, there's a lot of places like that now with how much pressure everyone's gotten. Oh yeah. Yeah, you just have to so, know, kind of have some of the secret spots, or at least know how to get away from some of the crowds, right? Yeah, exactly. And everything's kind of cyclical. Where places that you know kind of sucked four or five years ago might be good again this year. Yeah, you know, 
So cool. can you explain how you, uh, how you catch redfish? Like what is the whole, you know, what is a day out there fishing like? Yeah. I mean, we usually pretty much fish three to four hour windows. I mean, that's what I love about living here is on a typical fishing day, whether it's a Saturday or something, you know, if I don't, I don't blow the whole day to fishing because mm-hmm. you kind of really can't. There's so much downtime in between those good times of fishing. And it's usually a three to four hour window, whether you're fishing low tide, if it's low tide at 12, you'll get on the water around 1030 and you'll fish till around 130 or two. Mm-hmm. And same thing with the high tide. So, you know, you're not burning the whole day being on the water all day, which is good and bad. I mean, a lot of people will come visit and we'll fish for three or four hours and they're like, oh, right. What are we doing the rest of the day? I'm like, well, we're going to go drink some beer, eat some food and maybe get out for the high tide tonight. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it works. You don't you don't fish for a consecutive eight hour day. Typically. Gotcha. Now, if you're bait fishing, you know, like the bait fishing guides can. Oh, yeah. But with the fact we're trying to be visual, seeing the fish, there's really no way to do it otherwise. Right, right. And you guys are out there. And what what, what type of boat are you using typically? Uh, typically, yeah, pretty pretty shallow water skiffs. Uh, my buddies, you know, anything from Hell's Bay to uh, to East Capes, and our and a buddy of ours, uh, the Drake brothers. They've got a new boat that they're building that we've we've been using quite a bit too down here called Drake the Drake skiffs. Hmm. So. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a new uh, up and coming boat, so we're proud for those guys. Nice. And then, and what do you have as far as uh, rod uh, weight and length and stuff like that in that setup? Yeah, eight weight, nine foot eight weight is pretty standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people use nine weights as well. Um, pretty aggressive taper fly line. You want that big fly to turn over. Usually, using pretty heavy crabs. Um, anything from heavy crabs to shrimp, but mm-hmm. nine nine weight can handle anything. Okay. And what's yeah. a typical, uh, what's a, a pattern, a go-to pattern for you? Um, you know, anything from like a merkin crab that's just heavy and just a darker kind of olive or purple. Uh, you know, Mad Mike's crab is a great one around here too. Hmm. Um, any any kind of shrimp, like Puglisi shrimps, all that kind of stuff. And like a low tide where the water's a little clearer, mm-hmm. especially in the winter. Anything, anything kind of light brown to cream in the winter and then in the summer, pretty much heavy crab stuff. Hmm. And you're just, so you're out there spotting them and then you're just making long cast out to them and stripping it. And yeah, I mean, sometimes you can get, if you can get within 15 feet. I've oh, been wow. waiting and I've been waiting and had a, a redfish swim five feet away from me. Jeez. Just sit there and tailing. So it just depends on the day, man. Hmm. Some days you spook them with the fly line. Some days you can put a boat right on them. Hmm. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's a cool fishery. It's a great fish. You know, it's similar to how they do it in Louisiana, but in Louisiana, I don't think they're really tailing a lot. Usually they just have the fish just kind of sitting there hovering and, uh, they can see them from a mile away cause they're huge fish, you know? Hmm. Nice. So it's a little different here. Yeah. So if somebody was coming down there and just kind of for the first time, um, you know, would it be pretty easy to find a guide and go out there and find some fish or is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, they can send me an email. I can hook them up with any, you know, quite a few different options for sure. Nice. Nice. Yeah. There's a lot of guides here in Charleston. Oh, there are. It's a pretty, pretty popular. The fly fishing is pretty popular there. Yeah, man. The last, you know, they probably said the last 10 years, but the last five years I've been here six and a half years and I can just see how much yeah. more it's gotten just with me. The amount of time I've lived here. Oh yeah. So, yep. you know, this is the way it goes. It's a great city with a great fishery. It's kind of yep. hard to beat, you know? Totally. Oh, and it seems like that's kind of one of the things with fly fishing, you know, all this, as it grows slowly, you know, that's kind of one of the, the part of it, right? You got to deal with more people, but yeah, but, uh, it's probably better having more fly fishermen out there than, than other, you know, non fly fishermen. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's probably kind of the same with the bait stuff. You get a, there's a great college here, college of Charleston. Oh, yeah. You got a lot of young kids that come from Clemson and College of Charleston that that do what I did. I went to my, I I moved to Wyoming for four years after college, and they do the same thing where they want to move here and be a guide, huh. and then they learn after three or four years that it's probably not quite what it was cracked up to be. Right. It's hard work. It's hard work. It's hard work. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've I've talked to a number of guides here, you know, on the show, and 
that's the bottom line that you hear the most about is that, you know, and I've guided a little bit too as well. I mean, it is, it's probably the hardest job I think, you know, <laughs> you could have, but some people are just yeah. cut, some people are cut out for it and they're just, they, you know, they're perfect for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I learned real quick that I was not. Yep. Me too. Me too. <laughs> exactly. What was the, what do you think was the thing you, you disliked most about it? Well, you know, I can't say I probably quite did what you did. I, you know, I moved to Wyoming um, to work at West Bank Anglers. And in Dallas, there was a West Bank Anglers all, that I worked at all through college. So I just became, to, I came to know the owners. And so it was just a natural fit for me to move out to Wyoming when I finished school. And I was going to work in the shop for a year to kind of learn the rivers and learn the territory and learn how to row a boat. And just all those fundamentals that anyone else would, would learn their first year out there. And I became friends with a lot of the guides. I mean, working in the shop on their days off, they'd let me row the boat and take them down the river. And the more I came to know them, just the more just I learned that, first of all, if you're a guide, you never get to fish. <laughs> you know, you hardly have days off. It's yep. just hard. It's just hard emotionally dealing with these people that just expect to catch a fish when they've never fly fished before. Right. And this was, you know, on the Snake River, which is one of the easier places to do that. Um, and I just, you know, I was working four days a week and having three days off and getting to fish all summer. And I just realized it just wasn't for me. I mean, I did walk in trips, mm -hmm. you know, where I'd two days a week, I'd do walk in trips on the snake. And, you know, I, I like people, I like dealing with people, but man, it was, like you said, it's just not an easy job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking, so. yeah. Um, yeah, no, definitely. You're, you're totally right. But, um, I was thinking a little bit about the, uh, back to the, the podcast and your co-hosts, which you, you have two typically on there. Yeah. Um, definitely for the barely live show, Will Abbott, which he's one of our partners in flood tide. And he had to kind of make a somewhat of a, a career change about six months ago, which puts him not in the office as much. So that definitely led to us not taping as much because he's a, he lives about 45 minutes away mm. so that definitely led to us not being able to do it as often and then mike benson is the other okay. um barely life standard and he's here he's a nurse which he works nights so it's hard to sometimes get him in the afternoon gotcha because he's sleeping typically and then we got doug roland all right who's the fourth guy um that sometimes can't make it sometimes can he's I wouldn't call him an alternate, but he's just, he's kind of a optional as far as whether he can make it or not. And, um, and that's kind of how it goes. So. Yeah. And do you have a, uh, a story about any of the episodes you guys have had or, or about the guys you guys fish together uh, and do all that? Yeah. Like Doug fishes, he used to fish a lot more. He got a different job, so he doesn't fish quite as often. Um, and Mike, Mike worked at the Charleston angler for 10 years here in Charleston. Oh, wow. So he knows everyone. Yeah. And yeah. he, he fishes a lot and, and Will's got a second kid here recently. So he, he didn't get quite as a chance to fish as much, but you know, I'd say Will is the, he's the wittiest and the funniest out of the whole group. I'd say <laughs> he's, he's the guy that makes the most off off air comments and, just stuff that he comes up with is unbelievable. Yeah. It's hard to keep track. I just was listening to a few episodes and I am like, I still don't know who's talking. You know what I mean? So I'm like, Oh, oh yeah. Is that? Sure. Okay. Is that Doug? Is that Will? I'm like, totally. so, so yeah, it's hard to tell. Okay. So that's, that's uh Mike is the one that the, or he's not the guide, but he worked for the shop for a while. Yeah, exactly. And Mike, Mike's the loud one. He's the one that is the loudest. Will is the one that's usually making fun of someone in order to kind of poke the bear. He's yep. the one that's always the antagonist. Um, Doug's the one that kind of acts like he doesn't know what's going on half the time. Like, that's the thing. A lot of people ask me, Hey, how can I start a podcast like you guys do? And I say, honestly, you have to have, you have to be lucky like I do and have three good friends that are all entirely different right? and are the biggest cast characters and, and just start recording. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're, no, yeah, it's not right. like we're being, yeah, it's not like we're being characters and doing things we would normally do. Yep. I mean, that's, that's why the show is, is it's, what it it's is. Cool. It's, yeah. It's, it's, so, uh, it's, uh, I mean, you guys are, yeah, you're just kind of being yourselves. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Cause I've kind of talked about that offline. You know, I'm pretty, so far I've been pretty standard, you know, on, on the, on the air as far as my interviews. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's been kind of interesting because I have a, this whole other, 
you know, I, I'm not sitting there talking with my buddies, but, uh, but when I get, you know, in the camp and we're on the river yeah. with the beers, you know, this, uh, these, these Davisms, they call them come out. <laughs> and, uh, they're basically just those things, you know, whether it's a little bit of beer or something or whatever it is, but, you know, just some random stuff. And, and I haven't got to that point. It's almost like I haven't totally found my voice yet. You know what I mean? Like, I think you guys, yeah, no, you guys I, are just totally yeah. open. And I think it, it, that's, that's why it's cool. And that's, that's why we, like, we didn't set out to do, Hey, let's do something. No one's ever, no one's really done before in this whole fly fishing segment. Cause you know, everything's, from instructional to interviews and I get the most out of the interview stuff. You know, I don't really listen to the instructional stuff often, but mm-hmm. I, I definitely roll in the interview stuff and there's definitely a place for everything. And, uh, it's just been fun doing something a little different and it's been neat seeing other people doing some similar stuff and just to see how their take is on it and what they do. So yeah. Yeah, it's so definitely you, been fun. Do you listen to a few other, uh, podcasts or other fly fishing type of shows? Yeah, I listen to our buddies down in Florida, the the trailer park, oh, yeah. the Taylor Park guys, yeah, yeah, Taylor, Taylor Trash, Taylor. I guess is what they call it now. Yep. And then we listen to the the fish porn dudes out uh-huh. of Maine and Missouri. Okay. And I think that's kind of it in that type of sector. Yeah. Unless you got some other ideas. No, no, that's there. That's the thing. There there aren't a whole lot of. Uh, I've interviewed a few uh, different at least podcasters from around. Yeah, there's not a ton of fly fishing podcasts out there yet. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you've got like, yeah, th- th- there's, you know, some instructional stuff and like, I guess like itinerant angler, the Orvis one. Yeah. I really liked the, um, the fly fishing film tour one, the whiskey and water oh, or whiskey yeah. thing. All right. But they haven't done a lot of them. And then the Drake one's great. And the Drake, I like the Drake yeah. one. Yep. So yep. those are the ones that stick out to me yep. for the most part. Yeah, exactly. No, that's cool. It's always, uh, yeah, it's always interesting to hear, uh, you know, different things because there is a lot of, um, let's see, I think I was talking to, um, yeah, Steve, you know, Steve Duda, right? Yeah. 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 Totally. He's a great dude. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's definitely got some good stories too. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So now where is, so, so the art, I was just looking at your, your site. So you have, um, is that now you've got a bunch of different, uh, it looks like a bunch of your work on the front page. Is this like mostly kind of outdoors related or do you do other stuff? Yeah, it's it's ninety percent fishing. I got some hunting stuff, like some hunting dog stuff. Oh, okay, but I mean, my background of painting is basically since the day I started painting fish a whole lot, which was in high school, was painting fish. I mean, that's that's what I love to do. Like I'm working right now on a on a thirty six by forty eight real life size painting of a guy holding a GT John oh, Travoli yep. that he caught in I think the Seychelles, I assume. Wow. But yeah, so I mean that thing is huge, and I've been working on it forever, and I'm huh. getting close to it being done. And I just haven't been able to paint a whole lot in the last six months due to being busier with flood tide. So oh, yeah, that's cool. So yeah, I mean I can't complain. That's a, a problem I created. Yeah. But you know, I really want to be in the city of painting more. Yeah. Thing, but so how it long, just can't happen. And I'm not a, uh, an art, but I do have some art in the family, but, um, like, so how long does it typically take you to do some of these pieces? And, you know, this one, I've only really been able to chip away at it at night lately when kind of the flood tide day is over uh-huh. with. Um, I, I mean, I would have to say at least, I mean, right now I'm probably at at least 15 to 20 nights, anywhere from oh. three to, Three to five hours. I, I, sure. I but honestly, I have no idea when people ask me that. Yep. Um, I just never have a good answer. Right. Right. I mean, so, I really don't. And what type of paintings are you doing here? What, what's the? This one's oil. Okay. Um, thirty-six by forty-eight oil piece of of this fish, and it's very it's realistic with also kind of having a painterly look to it. I don't really do ultra realistic stuff. Yeah. But it it definitely looks realistic, but. Hopefully there's a sense of, there's a sense of kind of a painterly feel to it as well. Nice. That's awesome. That's at least my goal with mm-hmm. every painting. Gotcha. So you're, so a lot of these you'll, you're looking at, you'll have a picture and you'll, you're using that as part of your basically yep. the inspiration or, or basically painting that picture. Yeah. And the funny thing about it, when, when I've done paintings for people in the past with their, with their faces in the photo, I've asked them, are you sure you, do you want your face in the, in the painting? <laughs> and they'll, and they'll usually say yes, and I'll be like, ah. It's going to look weird. I would, yeah, I just, I would, I would advise not to. 
And they'd be like, why? And I'd be like, well, everyone that I tell not to that ends up getting it always tells me two or three years later that they wish they wouldn't have. Yeah. And, uh, and so I told this guy that same thing and he said, well, I don't want my face in it, but I want Walter from Big Lebowski's <laughs> face in it. There you go. So here we got this big GT painting and Walter from Big Lebowski is, is holding the fish. Nice. Oh, is that the so one it'll, be, it'll it be funny. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be funny. That's sweet. So cool. that's the plan. Yeah. You know? Let's take a quick break for our sponsors. The original tie right is a longstanding accessory loved by fly fishermen for decades. The product has been around for more than 50 years. It's an accessory you won't live without after you try it. No more drop flies or hooked fingers. It's a great tool to help you tie your fly by essentially giving you another hand. It's simple to operate. Just push in the plunger and insert the bend of your fly or hook into the retractable hook of the tie right. Then use the tie right to steady your hook and spin it like you're spinning spaghetti on a fork. Easily finish off your knot and you're ready to fish. All parts are manufactured and assembled in the USA, guaranteed for life against uh, manufacturing defects and free uh, with a free replacement. So you might be thinking, hey, do I need another tool in my vest? Um, you know, is this one that you should find uh, a pocket for? I think it is because I know I'm not getting any younger and I need to take advantage of every opportunity I can. You know, as I, as I get here and, you know, realize myself, see myself with glasses now for tag flies, it's just a tool. And, um, you know, you can make that comparison to say, you know, hackle pliers where, you could tie flies without hack up pliers, but it's a nice tool that helps you tie better flies. Same thing with the tie right. It's just going to make things a lot easier for you when you're out there in the stream. You're going to avoid, you know, dropping your flies, hooking your fingers. Um, so I want you to definitely check it out. I'm excited to have tie right on as a sponsor and uh, appreciate uh, supporting a small company um, in the USA. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of movement uh, around the world and, and you know companies from all over the place but it's cool to have have them on board so head over to tyright.com and uh, make handling flies your uh, a snap that's ty-rite.com do you struggle at times to know which fly to put on the end of your tippet I know there are plenty of times when I'm sitting there in the stream and spend a lot of time going through my boxes, not quite sure what to use. Um, what if you had an entomologist next to you or a biologist telling you exactly what was in your stream and the best fly to put on? It would be like having a guide next to you, right? Well, that's exactly what uh, a scent fly fishing does for you. Maybe you're heading to a new stream and you need to cut the guesswork out of it. The guys at Ascent Fly Fishing have you covered with their biologically sampled custom fly box patterns for your next trip. At AscentFlyFishing.com, you can not only take a look at these custom packages, but scan their site for a bunch of other resources to help you get better prepared for your next trip. Want to know how to organize your fly box? Do you want to take an entomology class or need a new fly fishing setup? They have you covered on all accounts. This is a great resource, whether you are a newbie or been on the water for years. With all the noise out there, it's really tough sometimes to know exactly where to find the right tools for the job. And I know that, um, you know, flies and having the right pattern, what's more important than that? Uh, entomology is definitely a big, uh, you know, topic that you can spend a lot of time on for many years and still not have it covered. So this is a way to cut to the chase learn a lot in a short amount of time and catch some fish along the way. As we noted, um, you know, with the tie right example, having the right tool can save you a lot of wasted time on the water. And this is another tool that I think uh, you are going to love. So head over to ascentflyfishing.com and grab your custom fly selection today. That's A-S-C-E-N-T flyfishing.com. Nice. So you got, so yeah, you got the, the, the art piece going, the fly fishing. I mean, it, when you think back, uh, you know, kind of your life, is there a, a story that sticks out that helped to get you, you know, where you are with the, it sounds like, so basically between the art and flood tide, that's how you make your living currently. Yeah. yeah not so much as much. Uh, I don't know that I'm starting to ramble. Uh, 
the flood tide thing right now still is a little bit, but definitely mainly my artwork. Uh-huh. I'm nice. still putting the money back into the business that I would make with flood tide. Yeah. Um, just cause it's growing and, and we've got a few employees now and it's, it's growing well, but my main, my main life and income is definitely for my artwork and mm-hmm. illustrations that I do for magazines and, hmm. and, uh, any other projects I can kind of sweep up along the way. That's cool. And what, what, uh, what magazines? Uh, I've done, I've done uh, some illustration for Duda for Five Fish Journal. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. I do some stuff for the industry, uh, angling trade magazine, um, that I just did, did one for AFTA and, uh, done some stuff for the Drake hmm. and I'd love to do more. I love, I love that style. It's a real loose yeah. kind of ink, ink, ink line drawing. And then you do a little watercolor in there and it's, mm-hmm. it's a fun, loose feel to it. That's cool. That's cool. And is yeah. there, and is there a, like, thinking back on your life, like kind of a story that helped you to get to this place where you're doing this, this type of artwork and where you're at here with it? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there were a lot of years that my parents helped support me, even when I was goofing around in Wyoming and in Atlanta, where every now and then if I need a little help, they were open to that, just because being a starting artist, man, mm-hmm. it's it's hard to connect the dots sometimes, and mm-hmm. I was working in, working in fly shops the whole way, too, and that was a <laughs> huge help for me. Like, I've got a lot of young artists that ask me for advice, and I'm like, well, do you want to be like a fly fishing industry artist? They're like, yes. I'm like, we'll work in fly shops. That's yep. the best thing you can do. I mean, you're not going to support yourself being an artist. It takes 20 years to do that. And I'm, in, I'm about right there. No kidding. And yeah, it's just, you know, I worked in retail ever since I was, and when I say retail, like fly shop retail since I was 18 or 19 until about three years ago. And finally one day I couldn't do it anymore. I had to concentrate on flood tide in my painting. And, yep. and I'm so glad I finally, and my wife's the one that finally just said, you got to just, one day you just got to stop. You can't keep relying on it. So <laughs> I did it. So that's definitely, it was a huge help. And I would mm-hmm. say my other, another story of what helped me was just in high school. Every project that did was a fish art project. And my art teacher let me keep doing that. Most art teachers would kind of make you do something different. But, you know, she saw that I was interested in it. And she would always support me mm-hmm. and let me do those kind of things. Mm. That's cool. And what, uh, mm-hmm. so over that 20 years, I mean, what, when it was kind of got tough at times, what, what kept you going with the, the art and everything? Ah, uh, man, just, just knowing that you'd always like right when you get in that bind where you're trying to pay the next bill, you would somehow sell a painting on your, my website or I'd oh, sell yeah. a couple prints. Something would always just kind of click where you'd get kind of lucky. You'd finally just something would happen and it still does. I mean, you know, I'll start to kind of doubt and kind of worry about things. And all of a sudden I'll get a commission for a painting or two. And it just, everything seems to kind of line up. It's almost, there's definitely a higher being looking out for these artists these days. That's so, yeah, I know I've heard that, that story. It's like, it's gotta be tough. I mean, you hear some of those where people are kind of going with it. It's, you know, I guess it's, it's your passion and you're kind of sticking with it, right? I mean, you're, it's not all about yeah. the money. And, and then eventually, wow, now you turn around and it's actually, you're, you're making your, your bulk of your income from it. So you, you've kind of made it there, right? Yeah. I mean, this, I mean, I'm busy all the time now. I mean, it's, and I love going to work. I wake up in the morning. I don't have an alarm. I wake up naturally around Sweet. 6.45 or 7 and I do my thing and I, I, I go to the office and I can't wait. I mean, office slash studio. It's kind of our yeah. flood tide office that has my studio oh, in nice. it. nice. Yeah, I mean, next thing you know, it's five thirty, and yep. it's just the, yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. So, I, was, I was thinking we were talking about this on a previous episode. I think I said it wrong. There was a story I always think about. It's um, the author Stephen Pressfield. He um, he wrote um, the Legend of Bagger Vance, which is okay. kind of, yeah, which is like a golf or whatever. But it, you know, it was like a big book that made it you know hit. It was a big hit, but um, you know, it took him like I think about the same like twenty or twenty five years to get to that. And in between yep. that, in between that time, I mean, he found himself like living in his car, you know, and like, because he, he loved writing so much and he was denied. He never was able to get published. And then Man. finally, you know, 20, 25 years later, he got his first book you know, published or whatever. And it was a big hit. And now that's cool. You know what I mean? And he, he kind of hung, yeah. hung with it. And then he wrote this other book called the, uh, the war of art. And basically uh, the yeah. whole, you know what I mean? So the whole premise is basically saying that, 
you know what, you've got to wake up and be like a Marine, you know, or whatever the analogies are, yeah. you got to battle, you know, every day you got to yeah, just like, if sure. you want it, you know, you got to dig in. And I think about this sometimes because, you know, it's, it's not always easy and it's, and it, but if you want to get something done, I mean, sometimes you got to just go for it. Right. Yeah. It's just, you've always heard all the different people through the history of time say, you know, if you love what you do, you got to keep doing it and sooner or later it'll pay off if you put everything into it. And, you know, every year has gotten better. So, you know, I definitely not complaining at all. I mean, I'm happy with everything I've gotten and gotten to. And I live in Charleston, South Carolina. I can go red fishing anytime I want. Hmm. I can paint a painting. And, and, you know, it's one of those things, too, that every time I've sold a painting, whoever's bought it is basically invested in my future. I mean, every painting you sell is that person's not just getting a painting, but they're investing in that artist's career right. because they, that gives them the availability to have a little time to paint another painting. So, you know, as long as you just keep getting rid of them, it uh, definitely helps keep you going for sure. Yeah, that's cool. So, uh, yeah, bringing it, bringing it back to the podcast again, I, I just keep thinking about some of the things that are popping in my head. Uh, and some of the music, you know, you guys have, you always have a little, little track, like a light sound of some, yeah, I don't know if it's always like Southern rock, but it's some some stuff. Yeah. Different stuff. <laughs> yeah. What's um? Well, you know, I've never spent you know really any time down there. What, what's the, you know the Southern culture? What do you think it is down there that's that's so unique and is so special about that whole you know that area? Yeah, I don't. It's it's funny because I just went to Pennsylvania this weekend where my wife's from, mm-hmm. and you know their family gets together and hangs out and parties and does the same kind of stuff down here. I, I don't know that it's that different. Yeah. I just think I just think that uh, I think the Southern culture just kind of has that ring to it, and people kind of open their ears a little bit whenever. But I don't, I don't think it's that different, honestly. Mm. But uh, you know, I think maybe just the whole idea of Southern food and fried food, and I think it all comes around and, and kind of centrally focuses on when people get together, they're usually eating and drinking, and I think Southerners do that a lot, mm-hmm. and. Yeah, I think it just it's that whole culture of family and and getting together and having a good time and raising a glass and breaking some bread and yep. you know dipping it in barbecue sauce together <laughs> and getting messy with it. Nice. Yeah, I noticed yeah. Uh, definitely a lot of the photos as I was kind of looking through some of your stuff. There's a, a lot of people are holding beers and a lot of the pictures and that's that's I mean I'm the same. I mean I, I think we'd probably be the same exact thing here. It's uh yeah. beer is one of those kind of staples that you, you kind of can't go on a trip without it, right? Yeah, and we kind of carry that on into the flood tide stuff, you know. Our slogan is good clean living. And there's nothing like getting on a boat with some buddies and in the downtime is about just as much fun as the good fishing because in the downtime you're cracking beers and telling stories mm-hmm. and that's kind of the whole spirit of the of the actual podcast. I mean, and it and it kind of carries on to what Mike and I are doing now. Whenever we can't get everyone together, Mike and I are trying to do a a different podcast called Right Brain Retrieve, yeah. where we're we're kind of focusing on creative side of fly fishing. Mike's a writer, so uh-huh. it kind of works great. I'm an artist; he's a writer, oh, and then nice. we call yeah, we're 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 calling anyone else that's a writer or photographer or, or artist or musician that's maybe, maybe in the fly fishing world. And that's kind of what we're doing now just because we can't get the whole band back together every now and then. So we're every now and then we're doing one of those podcasts, which is actually kind of fun because it's a little bit more serious. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll so, check that out. Yeah, I, I had yeah. um, Jason Rolf on, uh, for, on episode 33. He's uh, with the Fly Tapes podcast, and he also has oh, okay. the writers on the fly. Yep. Which, um, you know, I always kind of sometimes joke that, you know, the writing thing, I'm kind of a not a great writer. So <laughs> it's always I love hearing, uh, you know, and talking to people that are so into it, and that's that's his passion. Well, then we'll have to have you on the on the Right Brain Retreat podcast. Talk. Oh, is that what you're looking for, people that aren't, aren't good at writing? Is that part of the deal? No, no. Just, <laughs> hey, if you – call yourself any sort of rider and you fly fish that's what we're looking for i mean oh, there you go yeah we've got a good friend of ours uh i'm sure you've heard of him river horse yep nakadante yep. and uh i've become friends with him in the last couple of years and he kind of sits in on that podcast oh, cool. every now and then yeah. yeah so it's cool to have him on yeah definitely yeah I've been, wa- I've been wanting to give him a call too oh he would he would be a great guest he's uh very entertaining yeah he's got some good story and is he from down in your area or He's originally from Houston. Yeah. Oh, from Houston. Yeah. Okay. 
Cool. Yeah, and I'm from Dallas originally, so definitely that's kind of in my area, considering where I'm originally from, for sure. Yeah, nice. So, but yeah. What, um, as far as um, just thinking of kind of generally like, uh, re- you know, fly fishing books and magazines and things, resources out there, do you have anything that you, other than podcasts and things that you read or listen to or – yeah, I'd say definitely the Drake and Fly Fish Journal. Yeah. Um, n- not knocking anything, but like Fly Rod and Reel and Fly Fisherman, just you know, they're they're definitely kind of more of an educational yeah. uh, pieces, I'd say, and they're great for that. And uh, I just don't really get much out of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and I like Gray's Sporting Journal as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a huge reader. I mean, I flip through, and when it's something grabs my attention i'll usually read that but you know i know guys that'll read those magazines from cover to cover no matter what the story is um Mm -hmm. i'm just not quite built like that i usually lose my patience and Mm -hmm. flip the page but uh yeah you know and as far as books go um i typically read stuff that's historical and um maybe not even fly fishing stuff uh like right now i'm reading leonardo uh, da Vinci hmm. about his whole life and biography. It's like 700 pages. I'll be amazed if I ever finish it, but yeah. I'm excited about that. I'm totally into that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you, so you do a lot of the, uh, do you do much of like the audio, audio book sort of stuff? Or? No, I don't. Yeah. Um, and I would for anything else, but I kind of wanted to actually put my hands on this book and actually kind of be able to get into it. Cause there's a lot of illustrations and, pictures in it too that kind of help me get from page to page mm-hmm. just because it kind of entertains me and breaks up the monotony of reading <laughs> but uh leonardo da vinci it's amazing how his drawing and techniques and ideas have like stood the test of you know basically 500 years really? and it's just it's just really cool to read about his stuff what i mean have you learned anything from reading his stuff or just looking at his stuff or his work yeah just drawing skills i mean just the way he drew um, all the little, you know, inventions that he, you know, inventions for airplanes and, and wings and all this stuff that was so far ahead of his time. And even ideas and theories on gravity and stuff that 300 years before scientists even started messing around with. And even in the 1800s. So it's just neat, neat to read all that stuff. And yeah, just, I mean, his paintings were just incredible. Hmm. So, so I wonder, yeah, I guess it was a different time when he was, um, I'm not even sure of his, his history there, but looking at yours, I mean, you know, you said you've definitely sold some, uh, a number of paintings. What, do you remember what that first one felt like when you sold it? Yeah. Um, I've still got a picture of it. It was of a Colorado greenback cutthroat and it was actually pretty big for its size. Uh, I want to say it was like 12 to 14 inches and uh i've got a picture of it i mean i'm not gonna say the painting was terrible it wasn't terrible it was just very rudimentary compared to what i would do now Mm -hmm. but it's still pretty cool i remember i was working at the west bank anglers in dallas and it was a customer and he heard that i like to paint and draw and he asked me if i would paint a, a representation of his fish or i might have even sold it on him like you know let me paint this fish for you and and he let me and yeah, I think I might have probably got like 150 bucks for it or something, you know, but I was also 18 or 19 years old. So <laughs> getting 150 bucks for a painting you did is probably pretty yeah. good for back then. Yeah. And then I just kept advertising that I would recreate anyone's fish, the actual size and, you know, color if they would give me the photo. And so I've been doing that forever. Yeah. So that's kind of been the foundation of my business and my painting uh, career. Uh huh. That's so cool. it started with, yeah, started with catch and release paintings.com. Huh? Yeah. So I, I think I've had that website since like 2000 or something. Oh, really? So is, so how do you find your, your customers? Are they kind of just find you or? Yeah, I guess they just, uh, yeah, pretty much. I don't really do any advertising. Um, probably just, you know, social media has probably made a lot of painting, painter careers mm-hmm. happen in the last 15 years, you know? Instagram with, is, yeah. Yeah, huge. I mean, I don't know what I would have done without it. <laughs> no kidding. So it's, yeah. yeah. So that's been going I mean, strong for, what, like five years or something? 
Yeah, Instagram for sure. Facebook for probably what twelve years, ten or yeah. twelve years. I mean, Facebook was used as well. So, so before that, you were in the fly shops. Yeah, yeah, totally. Just word of mouth, and my friend heard about you, and my friend's dad got right. a painting from you. So that's cool. Yeah, word of mouth is huge. Yeah, exactly. So I was thinking uh, again, uh, kind of back to the podcast. You guys do have guests on it because I heard uh, I think you had uh, Tom By on, and occasionally, yep. occasionally you do a guest, or do you try to get somebody on each show? We try to get someone on each show. Um, there's been a couple where you probably haven't, or you screwed up the phone, or you know hadn't worked, or but mm-hmm. we definitely every show, you know, we want that to be the one serious part of the show, which mm-hmm. is 15 to 20 minutes of actually hey let's talk fly fishing because the other part the other hour and 45 minutes we might not even talk about fly fishing (laughs) nice you know so you know that's kind of the the part of the show that kind of binds it together where we can actually say it's a fly fishing podcast right yeah so yeah we've had tom on like you said steve duda river horse um man we've had Derek DeYoung, george martinez um a bunch of different people. Huh? Do you, does anything ring a bell that uh, those guests or any one of them sticks out or that, that taught you something? Do, I mean, do you guys talk uh, fly fishing and kind of get into some of that stuff or is it more about life stuff? Yeah, no. I mean, it's it's like uh, when George kind of threw down the hammer about a year ago about just what's going on down in Florida as far as the water um, quality and uh-huh. And what's what's happening with all the algae and all that kind of stuff. It's good to have those kind of guys that are actually there living that to kind of shed light to everyone else that's not living there because it's easy to forget about it when you're not having to deal with it. Right. What, so what's the uh what's like the less than a minute summary of what's going on down there currently? Yeah, just this water drainage where they're you know, they, they fertilize these bodies of water pretty heavily, like o- Lake Okeechobee. And the temperature change from that water flowing down, they just open the gates and this water all drains down to the Everglades. Mm. And the temperature change and the fertilization creates this just fluorescent green algae sludge that's Mm. basically killing grass in the Everglades and killing anything that lives in its way, basically. And it's starting to affect the water quality, which will in turn affect, you know, the redfish, the tarpon the bass, pretty much anything that swims in its water and get rid of it, it depletes the oxygen. Right. Wow. So it's a huge mess. And that's that bullsugar.org, I think is the website. Okay. So there's a lot to learn from it for sure. sure. Okay. So, and yeah, it's basically kind of a a battle in the corporation sort of thing that there's yeah, like, like any of the different regions around the world or, you know, there's a, absolutely there's a, nothing's getting easier. That's for sure. As more people are, seems like, you know, coming in everywhere. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. So, so do you guys get into much of that on with your uh, company? Uh, kind of that, the conservation stuff. And I mean, I was just listening to, um, well, I guess I was listening to another podcast that I think Orvis was talking about some stuff they were heading that, that not on the conservation end, but more of the, um, you know, kind of women in fly fishing. Yep. But, um, you know, there's just some stuff that got out on social media and they, you know, took a hit or whatever, but it sounds like it's a great thing they're doing. Um, do you guys, is that something you're interested in that getting into those sorts of topics? No, I mean, the main thing we've been doing is, um, definitely trying to get a more sustainable part to our business. And we've become friends with a guy here in Charleston that's doing just that, uh, Rick Crawford. He's got a business called Emerger Strategies where he's trying to, get businesses in the fly fishing industry for their businesses to become just more sustainable and little things you can do as far as, you know, minimizing your impact. And we've been doing the best we can to do that. And we became partners with 1% for the planet. And then also anything that we do, that 1% goes to a local business or a local nonprofit here in Charleston Mm -hmm. called Charleston Waterkeeper. Nice. And so, yeah, to answer your question, we've definitely been trying mm-hmm. to do the environmental side of stuff, not so much the the gender deal, yeah. um, not because we don't want to, just because uh, we we don't really big, play a big part in that. I mean, yeah. we don't really have a women's line yet. And no. It's just 
you know? So it's something we want to do. It's just a matter of, you know, getting to the point where we can do it. Yeah, totally. No. And that's, that was the conversation they had is the, yeah, I mean, Orvis, Orvis is getting into it, but I mean, it took a, like literally like, you know, 20 years or something, you know, they've been talking yeah. about it. So, and they're probably one of the bigger companies out there. Um, yeah. And you know, the whole, and I, you know, I, I definitely dig what they're doing. I just, I, I guess I, I don't really know how to even vocalize the way I feel about it because I think women fly fishing is awesome. I just, yeah. I don't know that it has to be so discussed and talked about as much as it does. Cause if you're a, a woman, female angler and you're a good fly fisherman, like I don't distinguish that person as no, Oh, but she's a great fisherman, but she's a woman. I just say she's a badass fisherman. Exactly. Like, and I, I don't know. And there's so many, Women, you know, trying to distinguish themselves as I'm a woman that does this or I'm a woman that does that. And I just want to say, like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's yeah. just it's kind no, of I a strange you. deal to me. I hear you. No, and I actually uh, had uh, April Voki on on the podcast uh, a while back. And uh, and she kind of surprised me because she was kind of on the same lines as you. You know, uh, kind of we talked a little bit about the whole sexism and things and, and you know, and all that stuff. But basically yeah. her take was the same. You know, it was like she was kind of like questioning that whole 50-50 movement as well, like because she had a little bit different take. But the funny thing was is she just interviewed um, those, you know, a couple of the gals from Orvis and they talked about it. Yeah. I can't remember the episode, but it was on uh, on Anchored. And um, basically it was clear that it came out that Orvis, I think, you know, I think their their head's in the right space. I think totally, it's, it just yeah. kind of came out a little bit weird on social, but um, I think the general, at least the numbers they threw out are like, you know, whatever it is, 30% of fishermen or of, of the fisher fly fishers are women, or it might even be less, but yeah, that they just want to, you know, they think it should be more of a 50, 50, but yeah, it's not like an on, onslaught against men, but you know, I, you know, for me, I think the bottom line is just, I think talking about it, is probably going to help because this, your story I think is right on because you don't think about it because you, you don't have that issue, but they brought up the yeah. story that, that the woman went into the, um, this woman went into a fly shop, a local fly shop and they were like, Hey, yeah, can we go, you know, get help? Uh, we're going to go fish in this river, whatever. And the, and then, uh, as the guy, the salesman was talking to her, a couple of, uh, guys came in and basically he put his hand in her face and said, wait, and went over and, and helped the guys out. You know what I mean? Like it's totally well, extreme and like who yeah, knows, yeah. you know what I mean? But that's the sort of stuff where it's like, okay, like that really still goes on. And like yeah. whether that's because it's a, a sexist thing or maybe he just thought he was going to make money off of the guy. I don't know. It, but that's the sort of weird stuff, right? Yeah. And yeah, I don't doubt that, that happened, but it's the kind of the same thing where, you know, working in the fly shop retail. Yeah. You've been there so yeah, long. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm sure that I offended someone, which yeah. when I didn't even realize I was offending someone, you know what I mean? Exactly. When, when you get distracted by something and someone comes in, you're helping someone and you didn't realize they really needed that much. I, I don't know. I'm sure it's, I'm sure I've done it where someone could have told that same story totally. and I would have never realized. Yeah. It. That's a great point. You know, but who knows? I mean, but Hey, I, I'm down with any lady that wants to fish. I think it's great. I mean, yep. no matter how any of these businesses advertise that they can do whatever they want to um you know but it's come on you know let yep. anyone that wants to fish fish <laughs> not to good take I, I totally forgot that yeah they, we were chatting you, you were at the shops for a long time so you've 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 been involved and seen all sorts of people from probably all around the yeah. world right yeah yeah and teaching when you teach fly fishing i get relieved when it's a, when it was a woman because they would actually listen to you and they're a lot easier to teach than men as far as casting yeah I mean, by far. That is totally true. Yeah, I agree. I We uh, had a fly shop growing up, too, and, yeah, they're definitely the better fly tires and everything else. Yeah, because they listen to you. They listen, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, uh, Paul, we're, we're kind of getting close to uh, going to wrap this thing up, but I had a few more if you've uh, got a second. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll do a little quick little rapid fire round here. I was thinking about um, – you know, just as far as gear, it could be fly fishing or stuff used at work. Is there a piece of gear that you kind of, you can't live without? You know, it's funny. Someone asked me the other day, you know, what my five weight was. I think it was like on a blog or something. And I, I said, man, I, I've still got my 590-4 RPL, 
from mm-hmm. 1995 probably. Cool. And I don't know that I'll ever need another five weight. Yep. I mean, that's, that's my standard. That's I don't use as much anymore, but that's my five weight. Nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the way it should be. It seems like, like gear should pretty much last. Like what, what is, how much, how many years should you get out of a piece of gear? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's 23, like, yeah, 23 years I've had that rod. Nice. Cool. I've broken it once, <laughs> but so. Yeah. What about, uh, is there one person that sticks out as a uh, mentor of yours over the, all, all the years? Um, I'd say, I'd have to say two. Well, kind of, Mark Cicino is one of my favorite artists that I've had ever since I was probably 17. Um, mm-hmm. Amazing underwater fish artist. And he would, I, I started emailing him probably in 2004, just asking him stupid little questions mm-hmm. like, how do you do this? What do you do here? And every time he would email me back, like a full page. And it just blew my mind that my hero was sitting here emailing me back. And since then we've kind of become buddies and he lives right by where my wife's family does in Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna river. So we've met each other a few times, done a show together. And two years ago I I put him on a boat and had him catch a redfish on the boat. So I would definitely say Mark Cicino and then Eldridge Hardy, another one of my art heroes that I've become friends with him in the last few years, which has been a true honor. Nice. Nice. What, um, do you have a place other, uh, other than redfish? Do you have any other, like a bucket list species or place you, you want to hit up that if you could go to soon? Um, you know, everyone's doing it these days, but I mean, Iceland, man, I'd love to go to Iceland mm-hmm. and do some brown trout fishing. Yep. I mean, that's, that sounds like, and it looks just so cool. So uh, that's yeah. definitely on the list. Okay. Perfect. What about um, just getting back to the flood tide? Do you guys have like where do you see this going over the years? You kind of have a goal in mind of, I mean, you guys are selling hats and t-shirts and stuff like that, but do you, you feel like this thing is going to be growing into other areas? Yeah, we definitely want to grow and diversify a little bit, and you know, eventually have some more, um, you know, lifestyle type button down clothing. Uh, we're going to have some shorts next year. Uh, we've had shorts before. We just being a growing company, it's kind of hard to do everything at once over and over, but just diversify the stuff, be more of a clothing company compared mm-hmm. to being just a hat and t-shirt company for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and most of the stuff that you, you're putting on, I mean, that's your artwork. Is that where most of the stuff you're, you're designing and yourself? Yeah. We get a lot of feedback from all the guys that work with, work with us and will and, We've got a lot of creative minds involved. I'm the one that actually ends up putting the pen to paper. And if you get translated to computer or whatever, but everything's hand drawn Uh and typically hand colored and then somewhat manipulated in the computer at the end of the day. But yeah, it's, it's real art. It's the real thing. And that's what we take the most pride in for sure. Cool. And you've got like, I was just looking at some of your hats there. You know, everybody loves the trucker hats. You know, I was kind of thinking like, you know, suppliers and stuff like that. How do you guys go through that whole thing? I, I've i been thinking a little bit about that myself, kind of getting, finding somebody who could do some hats. Is there pretty yeah. much like, pretty much there's tons of good suppliers to get that stuff these days? Or do you think, it, you know, finding the good ones is tough? Yeah, there's a lot. If you want like a quick, just kind of, you know, 12 to 24, 36 hats, you know, you start with a company like Otto or even Richardson. And then if you want to start making 288 of one style or, you know, 500 of one style, that's where you start kind of doing the more overseas thing or oh, okay. stay in the country, whatever. Gotcha. Uh, but we do a little bit of both. Yep. So yep. it just kind of depends if you ever want more information on that, just let me know. But yeah, um, it's definitely, it takes three or four years to learn and make mistakes and learn about what to do and not to do. I mean, we still learn something every day. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely not easy. No. Have you guys had a, a big order that came in that was like a, um, a kind of defective order sort of thing you had to deal with? Yeah. This, this past year we had some shirts that had the totally wrong piece of artwork on them. Mm-hmm. And that piece of artwork was even wrong. So they, you know, they basically made everything no cost. So we, gave those shirts to charity and just nice. give them away for auctions and stuff like that. So yeah, yep. it nothing, no major catastrophes have happened mm-hmm. yet, Nice, but it's one of those it, things I got a buddy yeah. that 
that works for for Nike, and he made a mistake on one little color on some some football jerseys, and they had to basically just wash the whole thing. Oh. He said he he's somewhat amazed he still has his job, but no kidding. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I've, I've heard, I've heard some of those stories for, it. yeah, it's definitely that's so, part of the game. Yeah. If it hasn't happened, it's probably going to happen eventually. I think, yeah, the important thing is, is how do you deal with it when it happens and, you know, yeah, obviously exactly. treat your customers good and you, you'll be good. Totally. Absolutely. Nice, man. Well, I think, I think we're about, about there. Do you have any, uh, anything I missed you want to throw out there as far as, you know, your, the companies and stuff you have going on? No, I mean, yeah, check out, floodtide.com um and yeah just if you want to check out the latest podcast we're doing that right brain retrieve oh, yeah. um but we're definitely still barely live is still alive or just kind of barely is it barely alive? yeah barely live yeah that doesn't have a website or anything it's just on yeah. um just look under podcasts okay. on like itunes and so it's not but it's not you know you guys aren't going to stop doing it anytime soon. No, that's yeah. there's no plan to stop. It's just a matter of just getting everyone. It's like it's like being married to three three dudes. <laughs> I mean, it's Jeez. just amazing how hard it is to get everyone on the same page. Right. Yeah. Totally. But so yeah. I'll, yeah. Okay. I'll uh, yeah at uh, wetflyswing dot com slash forty two. I'll have uh, show notes with the links you talked about here. Okay. So cool. Get you. And uh, yeah. So what in the next six months? Anything else you have going? We can expect from from the stuff you have going on. Um, let's see. Hopefully I got, I've got an art show in South Georgia in November. Um, and I'm playing at a BTT event, playing music at a BTT event in Bozeman at the end of August. So if you're in Bozeman on August 23rd, I think it is, um, with yellow dog travel and bonefish tarpon trust in Bozeman. So cool. Come on by if you happen to be in Bozeman. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, so yeah, if people want to find you, they, they can just go to is the Paul Puckett art.com the best place. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, want to thank you for coming on and chatting a little bit here. It definitely shed some light on, you know, redfish and just kind of getting a perspective from, you know, hearing the, the story behind, uh, you know, kind of the podcast. It's, it's good to hear, you know, what you guys have going. So hope to, uh, hear more from you guys and I'll, I'll definitely look up your new, your, uh, new podcast for sure. Awesome, Dave. Well, I appreciate the time, bud. Thanks right. for having me on. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. See ya. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Paul. And uh, please head over to iTunes and click the subscribe button if you get a chance. This is the fastest way I know of uh, that you can help the show reach new people. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.